Britain has rejected a French plan to send NATO troops into Ukraine, warning that it would be a major escalation in the war. French President Emmanuel Macron has suggested that several EU and NATO countries were considering deploying soldiers to the battlefield, and it comes amid criticism levelled at France and other allies for failing to pull their weight, despite Houthi attacks crippling global trade in the Red Sea. To discuss this and more, let's bring in Times Defence Editor Larissa Brown. Larissa, a very good evening to you. Welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. We've got a nice exclusive of yours to talk about in a little while. Um, but let's uh, chat first about uh, NATO, about Emmanuel Macron. Um, we know he's not particularly um, solid on his home ground. Is this um, his kind of latest attempt to try and make France look a bit more sort of, I don't know, relevant in Europe? Well, he said that he wouldn't rule out uh, the fact that uh, troops could be sent to Ukraine. It was, they were quite interesting remarks because um, I remember a few years ago, President Biden saying that America wouldn't send troops to Ukraine. And I, and I remember speaking to a minister here in the UK and they were saying, why would he say that? Let's let's be a bit ambiguous. Let's yeah. not tell Putin exactly what we do. Let's keep him guessing. Um, and, I, and maybe that was what Ma Macron was trying to do this week. But again, quite swiftly, the US um, said that they wouldn't be sending troops in. Britain followed. They said that, of course, we wouldn't send troops in or a large scale deployment to Ukraine. And so did Germany. So it's obviously not going to... Um, to happen. Uh, Putin responded also by saying that um, if they did uh, send troops into Ukraine, of course, there then would be an, an all-out war, which nobody wants to have. No, exactly right. And I mean, that's the problem, though, isn't it now? Because I've been talking to a couple of um, military experts in the last week or so, and they're all quite pessimistic about the outcome in Ukraine. They're worried that basically Putin has dug in. Uh, he may not get much uh, out of Ukraine, but he'll get a bit of it. That seems to be the kind of the current thinking in military circles. Yeah, Russia is making, you know, s slow but sort of steady progress. And um, I was speaking to security sources uh, last week and they were saying that Putin is, is more optimistic now than he was a year ago. And of course, we're still waiting for that funding from America to come through. Right. They've still got this £60 billion pounds, uh, worth of uh, aid to, to, to get through Congress. Um, and one, one Ukrainian military source was telling me if that doesn't happen, then the situation will be catastrophic for the Ukrainians. Yes. Uh, there really is a, a real sense on the front line that they're running out of weapons, they're running out of ammunition. Um, and this is allowing uh, Russia to take advantage of that and to, to, to fight back, basically. Uh, so the situation is looking quite bleak at the moment. Um, and British military chiefs, I know, are also quite worried about it. And they're trying to persuade the Americans to do as much as they can. And obviously, we've got the prospect of Trump getting in later this year. Trump's um, said himself that he's sort of not happy with NATO. There are fears that he might even pull out of NATO. He's suggested that Putin should invade countries that aren't spending enough uh, money on their own defence. Um, and so it's quite a worrying uh, future that we could have. Yes, exactly. And is it because it's a, a, an election year, both in the US and here, that whether the public actually wants more money spent in Ukraine is going to become a much bigger issue than it has been so far, because there's quite a strong body uh, of opinion in both here in this country and in the US where people say, well, hang on a minute, why are we keeping sending these billions and billions of pounds um, for what seems to be an endless conflict when we could be spending it on our own country? Yeah, it's an interesting argument. And um, I remember someone telling me a few years ago that there was never any. Um, there's never any money in defence. Um, you don't really hear Rishi. Uh, sorry, never any votes in defence. You don't really hear Rishi Sunak coming out talking about defence much. A minister told me that he isn't interested in defence or foreign policy. You know, he's more concerned about domestic policies because he thinks that that's what's going to win votes ultimately. Yeah. And we've got the budget coming up um, next week, and uh, we've been told that there's not going to be any more money for uh, defence. Um, and uh, there are quite a few former defence secretaries now coming forward to say that there needs to be more money yeah. because if you have uh, these chiefs coming out saying that we're living in the most dangerous period since uh, the end of the Cold War, then why isn't something being done about it? Why aren't we investing in our armed forces? And we hear like report after report about the state of the, the military and how uh, we don't have enough ships or aircraft uh, in order to defend ourselves properly. Um, and so if you speak to military um, chiefs inside the MOD, like they really do feel that there needs to be a, a greater investment in the armed forces. Yes, that's right. And it doesn't help when you see, you know, the second firing of a, of a missile 
um, from a submarine in seven or eight years, both, both of which have now gone wrong. And you kind of go, you're not really, really convincing me when you say, oh, don't worry, if it's actually a real one, it'll definitely work. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was embarrassing, no matter how you look at it. If you, you know, the Navy said that it was an anomaly and if we were in an actual conflict, then it would have uh, worked. Um, but of well, course, we haven't that, actually... Though, right? <laughs> exactly, and the proof is in the pudding. People want to see that the actual that Trident can um, can work, basically. And I know that Grant Chats is under pressure to to do that test again, but he's um, he's not doing. Um, and it'd be interesting to see why. Why? I mean, the money is obviously um, one aspect. It costs um, I think it's about seventeen million dollars to to fire it. Um, so they don't want to do it repeatedly. But you would have thought they want to send Putin a message that if he does do something, then we do actually have a capable nuclear weapon to fire back at him. Yeah, exactly right. And there are some machinations behind the scenes at the armed forces. You've got an exclusive uh, in the paper tonight. Um, tell us a bit about that. That's Ukraine related as well, isn't it? Yeah. So Admiral Tony Radican, head of the armed forces. Um, Normally he, he would do three years um, and he's been asked to uh, extend that for another year. So he'll actually be in post until November 2025. That's been approved by uh, Rishi Sunak and also the king, I'm told. Mm. Um, and that's quite interesting because um, sources that I was speaking to today were telling me that he's had a really crucial war, a uh, crucial role in the war in Ukraine. Yes. And... They were saying stuff that I didn't realise before. Like he, he went to Ukraine and had this um, meeting with uh, Zelensky on his uh, on his own for uh, quite a long, quite a I think about forty five minutes, where they talked about future strategy in Ukraine and battle plans. And the Ukrainian military source was telling me that Radikin had really helped them uh, to work out what they what they do in the war war against Russia. And this comes as the Americans were a bit concerned about looking a bit too close uh, to the Ukrainians and fearing that uh, Russia might uh, retaliate in some way. And so he seems to have really um, entered sort of a vacuum and done a, a really good job. And clearly Rishi Sunak's impressed and wants to keep him on. Yeah. And so, I mean, as far as uh, the people you speak to are concerned, I mean, do you see this going on throughout the, the rest, certainly, of this year as a conflict? Oh, definitely. Um, I don't think there's going to be any huge breakthrough this year. Um, I think that um, uh, there's no end in sight, really. Um, I think for something to really change, Ukraine needs to get hold of long-range missiles um, that can really hit Ukrainian uh, Russian territory. You know, Ukrainian military sources tell me that, they, that to, to change the change the war, they need to be hitting uh, con um, cities like Moscow um to to really show that there is a cost to the war mm. and they can't do that at the moment because they haven't got the ability to do so and the americans don't want to supply them with the kit that they would be able to do that with um and and yes without without that without sending them sort of new weapons more aircraft i i just can't see it ending anytime soon right and it's going to be you know a very interesting um year in that case militarily because we also had recently um general sir patrick sanders coming out and saying you know if things get a bit hotter and if things get really really bad in ukraine and russia decides to suddenly declare war on everyone um we should be prepared for conflict and it was almost like calling up um people for the first world war he's apparently been given a dressing down for suggesting that we should have a volunteer army. Yes, uh, Radikin uh, summoned him into his office after he made that speech. That was last month, um, and said that he shouldn't be making uh, comments like that in public. That you know these discussions should be held uh, behind closed doors. And Sanders had said that you know we should be training and equipping a citizen army. Mm. And actually, that. That does um, tally with conversations that I've been having. I, I went to um, a defence intelligence uh, base a few uh, weeks ago and I was quite interested because for the first time in, in, in years, actually, people are talking a lot more about how you defend Britain. So if Britain comes in under attack, if missiles are raining down on the UK, what do we actually have to defend ourselves? And usually these conversations have all been centred around sending troops abroad and what we would do in... 
uh, you know, various conflicts overseas. So to actually have that whole conversation um, taken taken to the UK was quite quite interesting for me and also quite terrifying. Yeah, absolutely right. And the, one of the other interesting things that came out of the whole sort of conversation was, particularly on um, a lot of phone-in shows and, and, and people's opinion polls, was a lot of people, particularly younger people, saying, I don't think I want to fight for my country, thanks very much indeed, which I thought was quite shocking, really. Yeah, um... Uh, the thing is, the army has a, a recruitment problem at the moment, um, where young people don't want to sign up in the same way that previous generations um, did, and the military knows that it's got to do something to try and persuade youngsters to do so. One idea that uh, Sanders came up with was to have a summer boot camp, um, so like gap year students could uh, spend a month uh, seeing what it was like in the army, they get paid to do it, and the hope would be that they'd realise that actually it's a really great place to be, and um, they'd carry on as a reservist. So they're, they're, they're trying to think of lots of innovative ways of trying to persuade the um, younger generations to sign up. But, yeah, they, they are struggling with it. Yeah, they really are. Um, also, I've uh, just got a bit of breaking news here. It's an FT story that's just come into us. Um, Vladimir Putin's forces have rehearsed using tactical nuclear weapons at an early stage of conflict with a major world power, uh, with a threshold much lower than anybody um, has ever seen before. Which is a bit worrying by the sounds of it. Yeah, I mean, t this is the thing, I think... Um, if you if you speak to sort of the experts in the in the UK in the in the defence uh, world, they 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 believe that the there shouldn't really be a distinction uh, between nuclear weapons. Like a nuclear weapon is a nuclear weapon. It doesn't matter if it's tactical or not. But Russia does see a distinction. Um, and yes, you know. Uh, uh, tens of thousands of people dead or hundreds of thousands of people dead you know it, it's just as horrifying and obviously if putin was to use a tactical weapon then that would really change the game in ukraine and whether nato would intervene i don't know but um we'd have to be seen to be doing something if they did yeah Exactly right. Larissa, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Larissa Brown, Times Defence correspondent there uh, with a big story that's going in the paper tomorrow. Uh